بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبئهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد I respect you brothers, elders, sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله In our heritage the Ansar, the Ansar, in the time of the message of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, those who help the migrants have a special status. The message of Allah went to the degree of saying that if it was not for the migration, if it was not for the hijrah, I would have been a man from the Ansar. Why? Because the Ansar were the people who gave refuge to the Muslims who were just a handful at the time. And they gave them home, they gave them abode for people who had been persecuted for decades. And this is where they found solace. This is where they found tranquility. This is where the message of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went and the Ansar embraced him. They said to the Messenger of Allah, just before he migrated, they said, we will sacrifice our families, our wealth, and everything for you. But Messenger of Allah, tell us what we will get in return. The Messenger of Allah said, what you will get in return is Jannah. Just one word, that's all he said. Jannah. Ka'b ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu was sitting there, he said, Rabbi al bay, what a bargain. Tomorrow you're going to be looking for bargains, yeah? <laughs> Boxing day. He said, Rabbi al bay, what a bargain. A business which will never ever fail. And you know, I just came back a few days ago from a journey where I went to a country which has many, many refugees. It's Lebanon. Lebanon is, has about population of 5 million. They say there's 16 million refugee, uh, Lebanese outside Lebanon. It has half a million Palestinian refugees and it has a million Syrian refugees. At the height of the Syrian crisis, it had over two million Syrian refugees. And it's a, a G place, but I really want to focus on the places that we visited. So we landed in Beirut, booked into the hotel. Next morning, we went to a place called Saida. In Saida, there is a camp called Ain al-Hilawi. Hilawi which means the sweet spring. And this is the largest Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. There's half a million, but there's 120,000 in this camp. Security is really tight. First day, they said we, yeah, we had to go back. Second day, we had to get permission again, and they allowed us to go in. And wallahi, I have never seen anything like this. It's a country within a country. Soon as you pass the checkpoint, it's like you're in Palestine. Not even like you're in Palestine, like you're in Gaza. There is no sign of Lebanon at all. It is Palestinian flags, Palestinian leaders, even the streets. There's only a, approximately a mile radius. There's 120,000 people who live in Ain al Halawi. The, the streets are narrow. Because initially it was small, it was just for a handful of people, and then it grew and it grew. Places congested, you can barely get two cars past many, many, many places. There's hardly any field for children, and the environment also feels like you're in Palestine. So anybody who knows Lebanon, Lebanon has about 35% Christians, the figures differ. The rest are Muslims, and then Muslims are divided 50-50 into Sunni and Shia. 
Lebanon is, is quite a liberal place. Soon as you go into Ain al Halawi, it's totally different. You got the hijabs, you got the beards. I was, a pro I was about the only person in Beirut who wore a thobe. I was thinking, ah, I'm more Arab than these guys. You go into Ain al Halawi, it's a totally different world. For 70 years, this camp has existed from 1948. And you know why it's like this? Why they allow it to be like this and why it's like this? Because the Palestinians keep the dream alive that one day we will go back to Palestine. And this is why, it, honestly, it's like you just walked into Palestine. I've been to Gaza, I've been to Palestine, Jerusalem. This is like you just walked into Palestine. And I was, one lie, I was thinking to myself, you know, with all these countries, Muslim countries, normalizing relationships with Israel, it hurts us. Every Muslim speaks about it. It hurts us here in the West. It hurts us. But I was thinking to myself whilst walking, I think, I wonder how it hurts these people. For 70 years you've lived in a refugee camp with the hope that one day you will go back and your own Muslim brothers and your own Muslim sisters and your own Muslim leaders sell you out. This was the place of Isra and Miraj. This was the place, the only time in the life of Umar ibn Khattab, in his 10 years of caliphate, he walked, he, he traveled all the way from Medina to Jerusalem to pick up the keys. This was the place with Salahuddin, people like Nuruddin, and hundreds of other leaders spent their life, their sweat and blood, dreaming of liberating this place. And it hurts us. And I, wallah, when I was there, I was thinking, I wonder how it hurts these people. I wonder how it hurts these people. So we, we were there. We went around. We visited a few families. More we were there for relief. <coughs> so we met a, a sister who was a Palestinian but Syrian refugee. So she came from Syria, but she was originally Palestinian. We went. Her, she had two children who uh, were quadriplegic she she was bringing these two children up herself her husband had been imprisoned and a while later she got the information that the husband had died they said brain hemorrhage but they know it's not brain hemorrhage it's torture and eventually they end up killing them you know honestly you know, this was a repeated theme through and through. You know, I have been in the charity sector. Everybody knows so far, homeless project, other projects. Uh, by the grace of Allah, I've driven on the first Viva Palestina convoy all the way to Gaza. I've been to uh, a Turkish border, Syrian border. But you know, this journey, honestly for me, was an eye-opener. Wallahi. Wallahi, this was the thing. It was an eye-opener. So she got the news that her husband had passed away. So she's bringing up these two children. She can't go work for 24 hours, but she's got a roof over her head. Alhamdulillah. And she lives in a house. Then we went to another house in Saida, which a lady, same husband, imprisoned, Got news a couple of years later, some, sometimes they get a letter, sometimes it's a phone call, sometimes just somebody else in prison will come and tell them, your husband's dead. She was bringing up six children or five children. And the first child, the first child, wasn't even her biological child. She was 21, she, the girl was about this year. She had growth problems. Brother Arif, so actually, actually I done a video on that one. Brother Arif did a video on the first one. She... Uh, she, she had epileptic fits twice while she was, we were there. She fell like this. It's not even her biological child. It's her husband's child. And she was bringing up her own four children and this child with nothing. 
with nothing. And me and, me, and, me and the brothers, we were discussing, we were thinking, wow. And this was just a few. We went to a few other places as well. From there, the next day, we traveled to the Bika Valley. So there, the Bika Valley is in a valley. It's about two hours from Beirut. And it's, it, it's, it gets quite cold. So in the evening, it was quite cold. Daytime, it was fine. But come winter, it actually can plummet to minus 10. And you know the cold over there is honestly not like the cold in the UK. It goes seeps into the bones. So we were handing out winter packs. So they, they, they were making lines. There were the brothers on one side and the sisters on one side. And I was looking at these people. And I was thinking to myself, you know, these were people who had normal lives once upon a time. They were just like me and you. They most likely even had more than me and you. And I was thinking to myself, today, I was, imagine today if my wife had to see me line up in a line to take out handouts. Wallahi, I, was, I, think, I think these guys, this, this man must have been the fruit of her eyes once upon a time. This man must have been her security. She looked up to him. And now her husband has to line up for a mattress and the likes of me and others have to give it to that person. Imagine you seeing your father lining up for handouts. You know, Allah says, Tilkal ayamu nas. These are the days that we rotate amongst people. Today you're up here, today you're down here. That's materialistically. There is no Allah guarantee that you and I tomorrow will have a, two pennies to rub together. Today you and I can't take out 50 pounds out of our pockets, 100 pounds out of pockets to give to your destitute brothers and sisters. And then if you and I were in the same position, we would cry, Aina al-Ummah, where's the Ummah? Where is Al-Mu'minun like jasad in wahid? The believers are like one body. If the head hurts, the entire body feels discomfort. And I was thinking about the brothers who had to see their, 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 their own wives line up to get a winter pack, to get a few blankets, to get a, a few other things. And wallahi, and the fact that we are giving doesn't make us any better than those who are receiving. The only way we can give is that there are people who are receiving. Even they have ihsan upon us and a favor upon us. You know, Aisha radiallahu anha, often when she would go and give sadaqah, she would say to the person, because the Messenger of Allah said, Al yadul ulya khayrun min al yadul sufla, the hand that gives is better than the hand that receives. But that is, not, that is just targheeb to give. That's encouragement to give. doesn't mean that you're better than that person. In the time of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Musab ibn Umair, Musab ibn Umair was that man, the youngster who set the trend. The clothes he wore in Makkah became the trend in the Hijaz. The, nobody had perfume better than Musab ibn Umair. You could walk... Half an hour after Musab ibn Umayr had walked down the street, you would smell that perfume. He had the best clothes. He was the most handsome of individuals. And then he embraced Islam and his family disowned him. And come a day in Medina, Musab ibn Umayr comes into the gathering of the Prophet Sallallahu and he barely had enough to cover his aura. And the Sahaba put their eyes down when they saw Musab ibn Umayr and when the Messenger of Allah saw him, he began to cry. And the Prophet wasallam said, I saw Musab ibn Umayr in Makkah. And by Allah, I never saw a man who had better clothes than Musab ibn Umayr. Softer hair than Musab ibn Umayr. And look at the man, what he sacrificed for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Messenger of Allah said, but a day will come. You will change your clothes twice in a day. And the Sahaba asked, O Messenger of Allah, will we be better today 
when we barely have clothes to cover our body, or on that day when we will change our clothes twice in a day. The Messenger of Allah said, in the eyes of Allah, and that's the only thing which counts. He said, in the eyes of Allah, you will be better today than you will be on that time when you will have clothes that you will change twice a day. Aisha radiallahu anha, because of the hadith that the hand which is giving is better than the hand which is receiving. She would say, place the sadaqah next to the person and don't give it in his hands. Maybe he will think, because he knows the hadith, that you are better, Aisha is better than that individual. You know, we went to a, we went to a place, we went to a family. Same story. Same story. Husband had been killed. Got a letter. You know, we, you know, in the West, we talk about closure. We want closure to the matter. We want to know where our families are. Wallahi, we found not one family who had closure. Not one family who attended their janazah. Not one family knew where their husband or their father was buried. This sister had four or five children. I put the, put the picture on my Facebook. Young children, the youngest one must be about four or five. She goes at eight o'clock in the morning to work. She comes back at six o'clock. For 10 hours, her children are unsupervised. Nobody to look after them. The eldest one must have been about 12, 13. She, so the UN have made these camps. In every tent, they, they, they place these, uh, these kind of stoves, heaters. They don't have the wood. They find plastic. They find garbage to fill it up and to light it. That's their fuel. Imagine, 10 hours every day, how much does she earn? 60 pence. 60 pence. And you know, look, I have been to many places where there's poverty. I, I, I came from Pakistan just about a month ago. And one of the reasons I went to Pakistan was because we were looking at projects to do it in Pakistan. So I went to all the Khana Badoshis, etc. You know, people who live in tent. There's a difference between the poverty here and the poverty in other countries. You see the hurt in the eyes. You see the emptiness in the eyes. In our mom, people are born in poverty and they grow up in poverty. That's what they're like. They know poverty from childhood, but they haven't seen war. They haven't seen the fact that their dad has been killed, their uncle has been killed, that they've left their homes, that they don't know what tomorrow holds for them. Seven years were people in that Beaker Valley were in the refugee camp. Seven years. And you know, may Allah give jazai khair to you know, the brothers, wallahi, there are so many people with, oh, wallahi, with so much heart, it's unbelievable. You know, as soon as I put that post on my thing, so many brothers contacted me, Sheikh, can we sponsor that family? Sheikh, can we sponsor that family? You know, honestly, me and brother Arif were there, you know, when you walk out there, you think, I've got to make a change here. we gotta, we got to make a change. And even, listen, even if you don't give a dime, listen, even if you don't give a penny, I would advise every single person here to go on a field trip. Every single person, because it will bring your life into perspective. We see videos all the time of this happening in Yemen, this happening in Syria, this happening in Burma. By Allah, when you're on the ground, the impact is totally different. Even if you don't intend to give a penny, go to a field trip. Go next month when it's winter. When there, it plummets to minus 10. And the grandmother that we met, a grandmother, she was raising her two grandchildren. Husband had died. The husband had killed by the Bashar regime. Her, her son had been killed. The father, the mother had left. So often what happens within... So these families is that the mother now can't manage 
to look after the children. She's traumatized. So the custom among Syrians is that the father's side will look after it. So you see this quite often. This grandmother, he must have been near our 70s. She's sitting there and I, wallahi, I'm looking into the eyes of these children. And there's an emptiness. Imagine your grandfather's dead, your father's dead, your mother's left. And, and the grandmother's telling us that this, the, 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 the stove, it's broken. The heat is broken. And she doesn't have enough money to fix it. And this is in a place called Arsal, which is just near the Syrian refugees, all mountain. It's snow there. The snow isn't like UK. The snow comes up to here. And this is why, brothers, honestly, wallahi, you go there, it will bring your life into perspective. I can guarantee you, you will come back, guarantee you. And if it doesn't happen, I'll pay for your ticket. I can guarantee you, you will come back doing shukr what you have. Many of those huge problems you will have no longer look huge anymore. Because you've seen what other people go through. You know, honestly, when I, when I went to these tents, every time I went and I was sitting with these families, and there's many families. There's another video I put up just this morning on my Facebook. If you want to be interested, have a look at it. Have a look at it. Really have a look at that video. I can't explain it. If I explain it, I'll kill it. I'm in the tent and I'm speaking about it. But you know, honestly, when you see the suffering firsthand of people, and these are our brothers and sisters, you know, we sh you, you give what you can. But honestly, Wallahi, more than even giving, I honestly believe this, more than even giving, you should save up the three, four hundred pounds and go on to a field trip. It will make your iman stronger. It will bring your life into perspective because when you will see these people who have nothing, who have no tomorrow, dunya-wise, but they're still saying, Alhamdulillah. There, there's a boy we met when we went to Arsal. His name is Baha. He's one of the first ch children we bumped into. So we were speaking to him. Again, father killed by the regime. So the translator was telling us that he works, he's 13 years old. He's got two siblings and a mother. So the garage was there. Uh, you could see the garage. He works as a mechanic at the age of 13. What are, what are our children doing at the age of 13? School, PlayStation, central heating, enough food. And I looked, wallahi, I looked at these children, I was thinking to myself, look how beautiful these children are. Look how intelligent these children are. Allah just made it. That Allah tests us in a different way. Allah gives us these comforts. And Allah hasn't given them the comfort. But maybe Allah is furnishing their Jannah. Because after every difficulty, there's a silver lining. And therefore, brothers, I want to finish off with a story which came to my mind many times. Wallahi, when I was sitting there, you know, me and a brother Arif were speaking. He said, you know, every time I sit in one of those houses, I was just thinking my own kids. I was just thinking, those kids could be my kids. You know, once Umar radiallahu anhu went and he walked around the streets of Medina. And this was what Umar would do every evening. And he walked in the streets outside Medina and he saw this woman and she had lit a fire. And on the fire she had put a pot of water and she was pretending that she was cooking because she had nothing to cook. And she was hoping that the children will think that she's cooking and they will go to sleep. But they were out of hunger. They were sitting there and they were crying. So Omar watches this for a little while. 
And then Umar walks up to her and he gives her salam. And Umar speaks to her. And then Umar says to her, he says, what is your opinion of Umar ibn Khattab? She said, I complain to Allah about Umar ibn Khattab. This was the man when a dog drowned in the Euphrates. He was concerned that Allah will ask him on the day of judgment. She said, I complained to Allah about Umar ibn Khattab. He said, maybe he doesn't know your state. She said, he's our Amir and he doesn't know the state of his subjects. And Umar went back into Medina. He went to the Bayt al-Mal and he said, give me a sack full of food. So they give him a sack full of food and Umar said, place it on my back. And the keeper said, no, Amir al mumin I'll carry it. And Umar said, no, place it on my back. And he said, Amir al mumin I'll carry it. Umar said, he said, will you carry my sins also on the day of judgment? I said, will, will you carry my sins on the day of judgment? And Omar now walked through Medina. The most powerful man on the face of this earth with a sack on his back. And he went to the camp. He lit the fire. The narrations mentioned that the smoke was coming through his beard. And he cooked the food with his own hands. And then Umar sat there and the children are playing. And this woman still doesn't know it's Umar ibn Khattab. And she turns to Umar and she says, I swear by Allah, you are better than Umar ibn Khattab. Then Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu is there with Umar. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf radiallahu anhu says, who is a multi-millionaire? He said, Amir al let's go back. It's cold. It's dark. And Umar said, I swear by Allah, I will not move from this place until I see these children smiling like I saw them crying. And then Umar went to Medina. He went to the Masjid Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he led the Fajr Salah. And Abdurrahman ibn Awf says, I swear by Allah, I cannot explain to you how Umar cried when he led the Fajr Salah. Because he saw believers crying out of hunger. So brothers, my plea to you today, we don't normally do this, is that today we are collecting for the winter pack for Syria, the Syrian refugees. It costs, we normally, what we make on Juma goes to a sufa, but today, especially, we're going to do it for the Syrian refugees. A hundred pound will secure you, uh, secure you a pack for five people. Whatever you can give. Whatever you can give. Give a penny. Message of Allah said, give a half a date. And even if you can't give half a date, just say something. Somebody comes and asks, even if you can't give a half a day, just say something nice. So, inshallah, we request you to, inshallah, donate. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist our brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alleviate their suffering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them jannatul for those for the suffering that they've gone through. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant their martyr jannatul for those. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroy the tyrants of this ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unite all their families in Jannah for Firdaus, and may Allah make us a source, make you and I a source of the alleviation of their suffering. Barakallah, Zakmullah khayran.